All right, Nerdy Bones, back in the studio. What's up, Nick? What's up, Keith? I'm super excited about these topics today. Oh, yeah, dude. We, we teased it last week, and uh, I'm going to, off the top, if I, <laughs> this is so funny, but if I get emotional during these, it's because it's um, two subjects that are near and dear to my heart. Oh, yeah. That um, I'll, I'm <laughs> I was actually thinking about this today, mm-hmm. like stating my subject matter, mm. or my uh, my source material, I'm sorry. My source material is me. <laughs> you know, like, but you know, I I did a little bit of, of uh, like Googling and stuff like that to like yeah. get get dates and stuff like that. But these are two topics that shaped my childhood. Well, enough anticipation. What are our topics today? Stanley and the Amazing Spider Man. Yeah. Those oh, Stanley and Jack, Jack Jack Kirby. Jack Kirby. Yeah. Well, I I preface I preface this most of my writing on Stanley, mm. but uh, Jack Kirby is uh, without Jack Kirby. Marvel Comics wouldn't be what it is. No, not at all. Yeah, like I actually wrote down. So it was uh, Stan the Manly and Stan, well, Jack I, Jack the King Kirby. I actually even titled it that. Nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because without uh, without Stanley and Jack Kirby, Marvel Comics wouldn't be what they are. They wouldn't. Um, like like I said, what what I wanted to preface this off the top is like these two particulars or these three particular subjects mm-hmm. were what shaped my childhood, and I have to be forthright. I lost my mom at a real early age, yeah. and comic books is what I delved into. Yeah, and without uh, you know, Stanley, Jack Kirby, um, we wouldn't have uh, the movie industry we have now exactly. with comic book movies. Exactly. So we would be at a definite definite it, it loss. Would, it would be different. Yeah, it, it, would, it would be, be a lot different, and, and it wouldn't be what we have now. Yeah, it would. I mean, not to discount the people who brought the comic book movies to the way they are now with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yeah, but, exactly. But without. Without these guys, none of that would be possible. Right. Yeah. And one of the amazing things about Stan Lee is he actually uh, hated uh, comic books at first. Really? Yeah. He thought they were boring. Oh. But it's because there was no superheroes yet. Like we had, we had uh, Superman and I think Wonder Woman and like because Batman came what? out. Batman came out in um, forty-one. Was, yeah. Or no, thirty-seven. Thirty-seven, and Superman was thirty-two. Okay. And Wonder Woman was 42. Or actually, Batman went even before that. It, it, I don't have I that on point. Infected. But uh, the, the, the one of the other big ones that was like like on the books, well, the big one that was on the books before, we'll get into this, but the big one that was on the books was uh, the Justice League. Yeah. So like, I want to get started. Uh, do you want to give her a little intro first? I do. Yeah, I we, do. Got a, we got a little clip we want to play uh, to start this out. And it, in fact... Like uh, the big thing with this one is like this. Um, like I said, Stan is a big person in my heart, mm-hmm. so I wanted to play this. Yeah, I'm doing what I enjoy doing. It's like other men like to play golf, so they play golf every chance they can. So you don't say to them, "How come you're playing golf today? You played last week." It was the same with me. To me, it is such fun creating characters, writing stories. It's an exciting life. And when you do something that you know the fans seem to enjoy, that gives you such satisfaction, you don't want to stop. Being interested in what you're doing. Um, I know my father, the poor guy, it was during the Depression, and he was out of work most of the time. So his life was shorter, and it was because there was nothing really that he was doing that could interest him. But I think if you do what really excites you, it just keeps you going as, as long as possible. Believe it or not. That's, That's a cool little clip, man. Yeah, well, thank you for indulging me on that. Yeah? So, l- like I said, it's it, the, the life and times of Stanley hits me really hard. And, like, I'm, you can look at me right now and see that I've got teary eyes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because, you know, it, it, this guy contributed so much to my life. Mm-hmm. And like, um... Without him, we wouldn't have the Amazing Spider-Man. We wouldn't have the Hulk. We wouldn't have the Fantastic Four. We wouldn't have uh, Thor. The we X-Men. Would, we wouldn't have the X-Men. So, like to me, this is a subject near and dear to my heart. So just bear with me. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to get off in it. He was born December twenty twenty eighth, nineteen twenty two. At the his na- his birth name was Stanley Martin Lieber. Oh. And then one of the cool things is like he had like when he started penning comic books, mm. he's like, "That's a long ass name." I'm yeah, just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just going to call myself Stanley. I didn't know that was his full name. <laughs> yeah, like he basically was like, "I'm just going to call myself Stanley." So uh, the the big thing I want to get into is he's the godfather of the superhero. Like w- you know, like we had we had Superman, 
we had Batman. We had Shazam. <coughs> or Captain yeah. Marvel time. Cap- Captain Marvel, yeah. Yeah, Captain America. Yeah, yeah. Well, Captain America was was Jack Kirby, but I don't know the writer. I can't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, I don't know who it was. But you know, without him, he wouldn't have we we wouldn't have what we know today as the superhero. Mm. So I just thought that was really kind of interesting to touch on. Like yeah. he's, I, I like to call him the Godfather of the superhero. Mm. So uh, when he was a kid, uh, comic books started as strips. Oh yeah. So the they newspapers. Were, yeah, they would they would be like, um, like uh, four or five cells. They'd be mm. like four or five cells, and then uh, the um, timely comics mm. started taking them and kind of putting them together all into one like collaboration. Like they would take like six months of strips, yeah, and then put them out in a book. Well, and that's where you got started getting like pulp comics from too. Exactly. Maybe. Well, yeah. the phrase "comic book" came from that. Mm. The phrase "comic book" came from these comic strips being compiled into, you know, and it wouldn't be one thing. It would be like, it'd be like uh, in like in today's terms, it'd be like Family Circus and Calvin and Hobbes and stuff. But like six months worth of yeah. those strips. Yeah, and that okay. and that way the kids could like go buy it mm. and pick it up and like just read it all. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> Stan, actually, one of the things I thought that was really interesting is Stan skipped fucking four grades in high school and in, in school. Yeah. <laughs> what? He, yeah, he skipped four. He, like, do you know which grades he skipped? He graduated at the age of fourteen. What? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, he graduated. No idea. Yeah. Oh, and his big thing is he uh, he uh, actually won the essay contest in his high school four years in a row. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Like so, like his whole thing is he was a writer. He wanted to bring stories. Which I thought was amazing, you know. Like his whole thing is like he he was um, he had a, a brother, a younger brother that was nine years younger than him mm-hmm. that he could never really like relate to because you know there's I never even knew he had a brother. Yeah, I didn't know all this <laughs> shit about uh, already. We're just starting out. We're like two minutes in. <laughs> yeah, but and I I neglected to write his brother's name down. Mm-hmm. But uh, um, in all honesty, the other source I have to cite is a documentary I watched today called "With Great Power." Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, I'm gonna not gonna lie to you guys. I was like sitting on my couch, wiping tears from my eyes. Oh. And y- you guys need to know how much this subject means. I can to hear me. it in your voice, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, like, so he at the when he graduated high school in uh, 1939, he started working at a uh, timely timely comics as like a go a gopher. Okay. Like he didn't really have. Um, he wasn't writing anything. Mm-hmm. He was just like, oh, go get me some coffee. <laughs> you yeah. know, and then he they he started like submitting stories, oh. and then they were like, "Oh, let's 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 check this out. You know, mm-hmm. Let's check this out." So at the age of nineteen, he m- fucking met Jack Kirby. Oh, and at that time, Jack Kirby was writing Captain America. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, at, at that at that point, Jack gave him the the opportunity to write. Mm. He wrote the fourth issue of Captain America. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he wrote the fourth issue of Captain America. Actually, getting in comic book history, mm. the first byline. Wow! Yeah, the very first. No the, way! Yeah, in comic book history, the very first byline. And if and well, you want to explain what a byline is? A byline is a you know it, you get like uh, so you say like Jack Kirby, uh, written by or written by Stan Lee, edited by Stan Lee, illustrated by Jack Kirby or yeah. or John Romita or John Romita. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always say the the tattoo on my leg is uh, John Romita Jr. Yeah. <laughs> so, but. <laughs> Like, Spider-Man tattoo, yeah. which we will get into later. <laughs> yeah. So I thought that was really amazing that uh, he was uh, one of the first p- people that was attributed to the first byline in comic mm. books. You know, like, if only Jack Kirby would have known what would happen <laughs> in the future. <laughs> right. So four years later, uh, Sna- I still think he would have given him his. Yeah, you know, he well, still would have given him his opportunity. We'll, we'll, get, in, we'll get into that in a little. Oh, say that again. You're talking about because Kirby. Well, uh, Kirby was older than Stan. Okay. Yeah, and that's because like Kirby was in already in the industry mm. when Stan started at 19 years old. Well, Jack Kirby was just amazing. Well, and that's one of the things I actually wrote down in my notes. I literally wrote this down in my notes, kind of like mm. as a joke. The dynamic duo. Well, if I had to p- pick one person to like, if I if I was able to own comic art by anybody, I'd pick Jack, Jack Kirby. Kirby. Dude, in a second, I actually have a couple of his art books. Oh yeah, yeah. His stuff like, was... He actually drew the first Phantom. Really? Yeah, and you know, and the big thing about Kirby is like, uh, I'll, I'll, w- in our second topic, I'll get into it. And he has a, a very distinctive style. Like you see his stuff, and it, you know, it's Jack Kirby. Yeah, exactly. Oh, one of the things I'll get into with um, in our second topic is uh, Stan actually took the idea of Spider-Man to uh, Steve Ditko first, mm. and the way Steve Ditko drew Spider-Man like Captain America, like all big and bulky, mm-hmm. and Stan's like, no, he's a teenager. 
Yeah. So then he took it to Kirby, and then you get the first. I actually watched something today about that, and it was like actually like the whole idea of that was actually kind of bunk. Yeah. It's like yeah. it really like the only thing that they shared in common of of, of a Jack Kirby and, and Steve Ditko was like the name. That was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the, nothing. Like there was no influence whatsoever. Yeah, and that's what's really interesting. I saw something cool too. It was like uh, he uh, like ja- uh, was it uh, Jack Kirby actually like did the original character design for. Uh, was it Black Panther? He did. And he I actually to, have that written he, down. He wanted to call him like Coal Man, I, I think. I have that written down. <laughs> we'll that. get to that later. Yeah, I have that written down. I'm getting ahead of, I'm getting ahead of you. So, but, uh, so at the age of 21, uh, Stan joined the Army. Yeah. And uh, he had one of the weirdest fucking uh, job titles. Hmm. He was a playwright. In the Army? Yep. Whoa. That was, I didn't know that was a thing. That Yeah. I actually have it written down here in parentheses with an exclamation point. Weird. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like that, that was like literally like, well, he was, uh, he specialized in com- uh, communications. Okay. But his main title was a playwright. Hmm. He like, so he basically would like write plays for like the USO and shit like that. Huh. Yeah. That I'd be curious like, to know what he actually wrote or if anything, it would be anything we've seen. I'm sure that's worth money to find, dude. Like to find like, Something like well, a, you see a lot of uh, those guys at the time, <clears throat> like uh, like Walt Disney used to do cartoons mm-hmm. for uh, for the military. Yeah, at the time he did. Yeah, and uh, the did. guys who like you know like Warner Brothers. What was it? What was that guy's name? Uh, I oh, know his dude. name too. Yeah, Chuck, yeah. Chuck Jones. Chuck Jones. Yeah, I yeah. think he. I think he probably did stuff for the military too. You see Popeye. Car- uh, cartoons that are super <laughs> racist. <laughs> I think I think one was like here sat Mr. Jab. It was like it was really really uh, racist. I wish you guys could have seen my face right now. Yeah, I mean at the time, of course, it wasn't think like we. Well, it was they still racist. It, it was still racist at the time. Yeah, but people were. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm getting a little off, to- off topic. So in uh, 1945, he finished his term in the army. Mm. Came so back. after World War II ended. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So he finished his term in the army and actually came back and joined Timely Comics again. And at that point, he started writing as an executive writer. Oh. Let's say he was an executive writer for for Timely Comics at that point. Mm-hmm. And th- and there was the only superheroes in existence were DC heroes. Yeah. So Superman, he, Batman, Shazam. Well, yeah. Shazam at the time I wasn't with DC. No, it was. Um, uh, oh, uh, you called me out. I don't remember. Was it Timely? Well, no, Timely. Well, time, no, it was. It was. Uh, I don't Charleston. Know. I don't know. Is it it might have been. I don't. I don't have that information on hand. Uh, yeah, I can't remember. But uh, so when he came back and uh, started writing, writing, sorry, we don't have a, a ton of time we're not, to, we're not, we're not to s- research. We're, we're not, not. We're not scholars. Yeah, we have about a. This week. isn't our full time job. <laughs> well, it kind of is, but after the fact. Yeah. <laughs> so um, in 1945, when he came back, started writing for Timely Comics, is when it actually when it, when he met his wife. Hmm. His wife was. Uh, this I kind of chuckled. Mm-hmm. His his wife's name to this day. Well, she she passed away a year before he did. Oh, his uh, his wife was named Joe Bocock. Joe Bocock. <laughs> he actually met her at a party for um for um I think it was um I didn't write it down. It's uh so he's probably married her for like sixty years, almost sixty years. Wow. But uh, he met her at a party that was for a, it was a fashion show. It was mm-hmm. it was like Tiffany's or something like that. Yeah. And he actually was uh, one of the interesting things I saw today in the in the documentary uh, with great power. Mm-hmm. He actually was drawing, like he was at home because Stan was never the biggest artist. Yeah, he was actually at home like drawing like female faces. He could doodle. That was about. Yeah. Well, he yeah. sat at home drawing like female faces just because mm-hmm. he was like trying to get used to that. Mm-hmm. And when he knocked on the door, Joan answered the door, oh. and in his mind. It was the exact picture that he drew. Oh, wow. And then in Joan's exact words, this is how Stan reacted when she opened the door. Mm-hmm. He said, hello, I think I'm going to fall in love with you. Oh. <laughs> and, it, and, and it lasted like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like I, decades after yeah, that. So I thought that was amazing when I read that. It was That's like, cool. wow, dude. And like, uh, I didn't know it, but Stan had uh, two kids. Mm-hmm. W- one kid was named JC. It was, her name was Joan Carl, named after... Uh, um, her mother Joan mm-hmm. and her uncle Carl. Huh. So they called her JC. And then he had a second daughter that died like almost a month after being born. Oh. Which is kind of rough. Oh, yeah. But like Stan in particular said like I think it, you know after after her death we poured all of our love into her. Okay. So like she she like uh, could you imagine being Stanley's kid? Jeez. <laughs> could you imagine she, that? She's like, probably she's still alive. She's too. maybe I saw an interview with her that was from 2000. She's probably like 60, 70 years old. Not even that. Not even no? that. She, like, she would have been born in the 50s. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah she'd be about 60 yeah. or so. 
So shortly after that is like when um, I one of the things I read into was uh, there is a book that was put out called The Seduction of Innocence. Mm-hmm. Are you familiar with that? No. So the the book this book came out basically blaming basically blaming all like childhood um, vagrancy um, violence on like comic books and movies. Oh, okay. So this is what led to the comic book code. Oh. So do you get maybe I have yeah maybe I have actually heard of that before yeah yeah so and I actually watched an interview with the guy and he's which is one subject I think we might want to do at one point is the comics code yeah yeah, yeah which I thought was kind of crappy because you know they, it's the in the sixties see the comics are an outlet for the childhood you yeah. know like it's not like it's not like they weren't they weren't that even that adult at that time the way we would think of it now well and the big thing is this is where like this is where comic books kind of like became. Um, quote because back in the day mm. back in the like when they first came out they weren't for they weren't directed for kids oh you look at the horror comics yeah from back tales then. from the crypt yeah like they weren't like ec comics i think is what yeah, it was. yeah yeah so this is where the comic book code comes in and then everything kind of gets watered down yeah and they couldn't do they couldn't show any action and they, they couldn't, couldn't show, show doing drugs or nothing like yeah. that yeah it was very it was very watered down so at that point stan like started getting bored yeah. Like he just like who wouldn't wa- man? Yeah, he's just like we're writing romance stories at this point. That's like, pretty much all they could do. Yeah, yeah. Like and he's like, okay, we're gonna do. This well, you got to tell me like Batman. I mean, Batman was terrible. Well, then. Bat Bats was in full swing at this point. Bat, mm-hmm. you know, in DC Comics, Bats was still doing, still going strong as a superhero. Yeah. So basically, Stan's like getting bored. And like I'm gonna leave. Mm-hmm. I don't want to do this anymore. Mm-hmm. So that's where the Fantastic Four was born. Ah. So he he was like, we need we need a hero, we need heroes. Yeah, and then you come up with the Mister Fantastic, Johnny Storm, the Thing, Sue Storm. Well, one thing I watched in the video was was the what Stanley would do is he'd come to artists with like very broad ideas. Let me let me get to that. Okay, that, yeah, that's, that's the Mar- that's okay. the Marvel technique. Okay, go. Yeah, so uh, he basically um, he created the four. Yeah, you know, I just I, in my mind I just call it the four. And at that point, it's actually Marvel comic books. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's it's actually it's actually coming out as Marvel. Comics. Oh, okay. That's when they changed their name. Yeah. And that was what what year? Sixty. Sixty one. Sixty one. I thought it was yeah. sixty one. No, my dad was born in sixty one. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, he was. So at that point, like uh, the Fantastic Four was a hit, and uh, so Steve Ditko, <coughs> Steve Ditko, Jack Kirby, Stan Lee, John Romita, all like were like this like uh, what what I call it? like a perfect storm. Yeah. Of uh, you know just ideas and artists. So at this point is where uh, Kirby and Stan Lee decided to make the Hulk. Oh. 19, uh, the the very first Hulk came out in May 1962. And uh, the big thing that I w- was really interested in with is like, Stan was talking to Kirby. And like Stan's idea in his mind, he's like, Kirby's going to fucking hate this. Yeah, Kirby's going to hate this idea of this <laughs> character. Because he, he came to Kirby and he was like, I want a sympathetic monster. Those are the exact words, quote, sympathetic. And that's all, probably all he'd give them, too. Yeah. And and then, like, so about two days later, Kirby came back to Stan with artwork of the Hulk. Mm. And to this day, Hulk is one of the most popular characters. Well, someone with comics. the Fantastic Four, like, uh, when it came to the Galactus issues, he mm-hmm. actually went to the, he went to Jack Kirby. He's like, I want, like, I want, like, a godlike figure. Yeah. And Jack Kirby came back to him with the Galactus. Yeah. So this is where you like a, like you were like right on point. Mm. So this is what I want to get into. Was called the Marvel method. Mm. So what Marvel would do is they would take okay, so whatever writers that were assigned to whatever titles would get together with all of the artists, mm-hmm. all of the artists employed by the Marvel. Bullpen. Yeah, and they they would like give their idea mm. and like okay, this is where I want the story to go. This is what I want the story to be. This is what I. Um, this is what I want. C- this is kind of the story that I want to tell, and this is where it's going to end. Yeah. So all of the artists would go to work and submit different pieces of artwork, without mm-hmm. the words, mm-hmm. without the words, yeah. like word bubbles inserted without mm-hmm. the words, and he would have seven or eight different people coming to him with these storyboards mm-hmm. of completely drawn out comic books, and then he would pick one. And then right in the fucking well, this is what I want to get to with with Jack Kirby was with uh, and when it came to the Fantastic Four, you know that was really Kirby's baby for the most part. Yes, it was. What would happen was was Stan Lee, and this is going. I'm going off a video I I saw on YouTube earlier. I can't remember the the name of the guy who did it who put it out, but anyway, like but the information he relayed, I want to relay to you 
which is what would happen with Stanley. Would, he would come to artists with very broad ideas yeah, and just be like, hey, do something with this. And the artist would go ahead and, and make and like with, with Jack Kirby, they would go to he would, Jack Kirby would just go ahead and do his own thing. And come up with the, you know, he'd be like, okay, I'm going to take this idea, I'm going to run with it. Mm-hmm. And he'd come back with, with these all these characters, these looks, everything. Yep, and, yep. and what it would happen was he'd draw out the whole comic book. Which from, is an idea. Which is from, an the idea. Idea, from this idea, he'd, he'd, he'd pretty much script the whole thing, is the way we think of scripting, make the whole comic book. And he'd write little liner notes like, hey, I think this is what it should say. He'd put the mm-hmm. word bubbles in there. And then he'd bring it to, like, Stan Lee. And Stan Lee would just make, would write the dialogue off of that. Yeah. yeah. And which is, which is not really... And I, I, I'm gonna, well, I'm detective. honestly gonna in, insult Stanley right now. He was hey, not. Hey, hey, remember who you're I'm talking sorry. to right now? Dude. I'm sorry. And I know, you know, it's like you shouldn't speak ill of that, but he was not a good writer, in my opinion. Um, but at the time, that was kind of the way it was. It was like kind of a little hackney type writing in a way. Not to say the stories were bad, but just the, and, and it was just the way that people talked back then, you know, and that was the way the comics were back then. Yeah. Well, but I just—I never on, thought I'm of him as a very good writer. I'm gonna. Have he didn't to, have anything that was like super thought provoking to me. It was—it was very basic. I'm gonna have to fun. go. On, I'm gonna have to go on the record and strongly disagree. Hey, but we'll just move forward from there. But but I just want to say, but but when it came to yeah, Jack Kirby, he would come up with these characters and these stories, and in fact, it was like he would actually put these and give these to Stan Lee and make these whole things, and he would just—he wouldn't even read the comics afterwards. After they put it out and Stanley yeah, made a script, yeah. it was a, there was one thing it was like well, without like Jack Lee would spend or Jack Curry would spend two weeks working on this comic and do the all the art and everything. Well, in and all then fa- give it to Stanley, fair- and Stanley would would write the whole thing in like two hours. In all fairness, I'm a, an artist myself. Mm-hmm. In all fairness, drawing takes a lot longer. Oh than well, yeah. I'm mean, I'm not to say like it's it's so much. It's like oh, well, two hours is kind of discounting him, but it's like. Without without the mind of Stanley, there would be no Spider-Man. Yeah, I'm not I'm not trying to discount the guy in any way. <laughs> I mean, he did come with, up, up with a, with a lot of the ideas. I think his his real talent was uh, on the business side and the marketing side. Yeah, absolutely, the background part that absolutely. you don't think about. Like it wasn't really like the story that was out there necessarily, mm-hmm. but it was it was everything that came from that. Right, right. and making these characters large in life and right. making them just well, without bigger. The, without the like, like I said, but I'm, I but I do feel like Jack Kirby never got his real due, and that I was, would have to agree. And that was one thing with Jack Kirby was he never felt like he got his real due of like oh, yeah. being like. I, I he, like yeah that. he'll be like created by you know Stanley and Jack Kirby but it was more it you know it was like eighty percent Jack Kirby and twenty percent Stanley. Well, I would like to feel it was 50, or 70, 50, 70, 30. It could have been yeah, well, but without, you, know, you could without, say fifty fifty. Without Stan, he wouldn't have had these characters to draw. Yeah. But he would mainly go to them with a broad idea of like, yeah. hey, do this. You know, and the and the the funny thing is, but it is kind of cool because at the same time he was giving these artists creative freedom yeah. to kind of do their own thing. Yeah, and the, like and the, I actually have an insight on this because like I was telling you like i've done uh artwork for evil ernie Mm -hmm. and the thing is is like i was just emailed okay this is this is the scenario to draw yeah and i just and it's that method is still used today it's like the 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 writers are like okay this is this is the scene this is what's happening well nowadays it's so much more structured you ever you ever see like an alan moore script yes dude (laughs) he like if you if no if if you've never seen alan moore script uh he will write out like a page on one, one on one panel for yeah. like one panel or yeah. one page like he'll write a full page descripting like doing a description of the whole thing yeah it's yeah. crazy and most writers honestly don't do that <laughs> well alan moore is kind of amazing they write it more like a screenplay yeah kind of. yeah well and like, oh, alan moore is fucking well, amazing. like you know just you know like um the big thing is i believe you know i am a true and true and true comic book fan mm-hmm. i 100 percent believe without the writer without the artist yeah we wouldn't have it at all. It is a very collaborative effort. Yeah, which I, well, it was one thing I love with comics. Uh, you know what I wanted to add because it's always like if I see if a certain writer has written the comic or a certain artist, I'm like, oh, I'm more I'm more yeah. adept to like pick that that the, book up because I'm like, oh, I love that guy's writing or I love that guy's art. Like I want to pick that up because I know they do good shit. You got me all excited. Mm-hmm. You bring me brought brought me to something that I didn't write down because I didn't want you to see it. Uh-huh. I have a question for each subject. Yeah, who is your favorite writer? Your favorite comic writer, Garth Ennis. Garth Ennis. Give an example of his work. The Just Punisher, <sighs> the modern day Punisher. <sighs> Welcome back, Frank. <sighs> the Punisher Max series. Pretty much any good Punisher se- story you've read in the last twenty years. Good answer, Garth Ennis. Uh, Preacher. Oh, dude! If you like Preacher, save that for the second question. Um, <laughs> he's just—he's all my all-time one of my all-time Preacher. favorites. Him and Grant Morrison. Grant Morrison's amazing. 
Like I, I was gonna say, like, because I was uh, my second question. We'll come back to it. Mm-hmm. Is because Spider Man is my favorite character of all time. Yeah, I was gonna ask you your favorite character. And Punisher. Yeah, uh, yeah, but yeah, we'll get back into that. So, uh, kind of continuing on the story. So this brings us to the Silver Age of comic books. Okay. Damn it! Stupid. <laughs> so Sorry. This- his phone keeps going off. So, turn that shit on silent, dude. I thought it was. <laughs> You're breaking it. <laughs> so this breaking the, the immersion. So this brings us to the Silver Age of comic books from uh, 1961 to 1963, mm. to where the sales of Marvel comic books jumped from seven million dollars mm-hmm. to thirteen million dollars. Wow! In the 70s, dude. You know, it's like, probably a fair era of comics. Honestly, is the Silver Age. Well, that, I do love the current age of comics, but if I had to go back, I would definitely age. go to the Silver Age. So this is this is like my favorite part of. Uh, what I, what I wrote out, mm-hmm. enter the Spider Man. Uh-huh. So that's the way I, I <laughs> so love that. That's the way I wrote it. Enter the Spider Man. Yeah. So uh, Amazing Fantasies was almost canceled, because Ama- Amazing Fantasies was like, um, well, fantasy, not fantasies. It was called Amazing Fantasies. Yeah. It was, I thought amazing, it was just fantasy. It was Amazing Fantasies. Okay. I have the book. All right. <laughs> I'll go with you, man. <laughs> so, but it's uh, basically it was more like detective stories. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like your true crime kind of stuff. Okay. On a kind the of comics code approved uh, yeah, kind of com- thing. Exactly. And then uh, basically that that line was getting ready to be canceled. Mm. And Stan was sitting. I remember, dude. I remember this. I remember this story from when I was nine years old. Uh. Watching him, I watched an interview with him, where he came up with the Amazing Spider Man. Mm. He was like literally sitting at his desk trying to come up with a new character, mm. and he saw a fly land and stick on the wall, mm. and he's like. The fly man, <laughs> like that's yeah. li- that, that's literally <laughs> like what came into his head, and then he talked about it with his couple of his buddies. He was like, mm-hmm. "No, nah, dude," his buddies were like, "Spider Man, Spider Man." So like, you know, like th- that that's way better. And he like the fly man, you know, Spider Man, but the uh, Spider Man sales in uh, sixty two just made Amazing Fantasy just f- fly off the shelves. Yeah, just fly off the shelves. So. Spidey is credited with saving Marvel comic books. Yeah. One of the all-time greatest covers of all time, too. Yeah, oh, dude. Well, and Fantastic Four actually, I think, guested in that epi- in that uh, comic, right? Yep, yep, yep. And so one of the other things I wanted to cite with this is one of his uh, creations. And I am kind of, like, jumping topics here. Mm-hmm. But uh, one of the things I wanted to cite with this is, like, Stan wanted to, like, Stan hated sidekicks. Yeah. He hated sidekicks. That's side- true. You, you don't see many sidekicks yeah, in Marvel. Stan hated sidekicks. and that. Uh, uh, Thank on, God he hated sidekicks. Yeah, so, like. Um, imagine, like, Spider-Boy. Well, I, I there know they was did. Spider-Boy. <laughs> there, was there was Spider-Boy. Spider-Boy. But, but that was a spinoff. Yeah. But uh, the big thing for him, he was like, you know what? Let's have the teenager have the powers. Yeah. Let's have the teen. Let's have the teenagers be the hero. Let's have the teenager be the hero. So like that's you know there was like breathing new life into the comic book world. Was yeah. The creation. Of well, Spider-Man. and then people who were or kids who were reading the comic at the time, because most people who read those comic uh, comics at the time were kids, they could identify with them. Exactly. With him. Well, and you bring me perfectly to my next point. Mm-hmm. Like, Stan decided like when because he wasn't quite the CEO of Marvel at that point. Yeah. But his all of his uh, following heroes were what you would call a flawed hero. Yeah, you know, like because Peter had to fucking pay bills. Yeah, he had he had to keep his idea. D- he was a real person. He was a real person. And then you get like uh, the Hulk. Well, the Hulk was b- before that, but he started creating like flawed he- people that heroes that you could create or uh, like relate to, mm-hmm. like the X Men. Yeah, you know, like I I got kind of that a little bit later. But, like, his whole thing is he started creating heroes that the everyday person could relate with. Mm. You know, like, it, you're not, it's not this Superman that's this omnipotent being that... Yeah. Or no, Batman, who's a billionaire. Yeah, he started creating, like, the everyday hero mm-hmm. is kind of the way I wrote it down. Like, you could potentially be this person exactly. in the right circumstances. Exactly. Yeah. So one of the other things I wanted to hit is, like, he really wanted to pursue uh, comic books... In a way, it, to get their notoriety in like uh, pop culture, mm. he really wa- like one of the things he I didn't write down the exact quote, but he he mentioned like okay, so if like Shakespeare and Michelangelo decided to do a comic book, like let's say say Shakespeare will write it, Michelangelo would illustrate it. Ooh. People people would pay attention. Oh yeah, you know like so if Shakespeare, <coughs> so Shakespeare the master so yeah, so yeah. Stanley and Jack Kirby exactly he wanted to make sure that the people that were involved got their due mm. and uh, and that's kind of where I want to get into Kirby 
I guess Stanley was actually a big proponent about making sure that uh, artists were paid well, like were I, paid well. Like I said, he was the first byline ever. And one thing I want to put in effect, is, or one thing I do want to say about Jack Kirby was Jack Kirby did make a decent living off of what he was doing. Yeah, and he but he always asked for more money, and he because he deserved it. He did, but he was also he was bad with money. <laughs> as far as far as I know, like I'm not I, I'm not like a, I haven't done a ton of research into Jack Kirby. But at the same time, like Jack Kirby made a decent living off of he what did. he was doing he at Marvel. Did. Well, he, he but he always it. wanted more, and he was just he wasn't the best with his money. He was just kind of well, he, he, blow he, it. It seemed it seemed like from what I've what I've seen. Well, without Jack Kirby, there a lot of artists today would have a different style. Oh yeah, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like a lot of a lot of artists today in the comic book world would have a different take, well, like uh, like on mush. Um, uh, the word I want to use is um, uh, muscular structure. He had it like. Kirby, because I'm an artist. Well, also, you know, the whole thing but, about like drawing the eyes bigger, yep. like when you're a villain. Yep, yep. To make yep. them more menacing. And, and the, that was a Jack. That was probably a Jack and, Kirby and thing. This. Yeah, the, the kind of scowl. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Cur Kirby kind of was uh, all of our, all of myself included, all comic book artists we draw. From. You ask any comic book artist who are, you know, one of the biggest influences they've had. Mine would be John Romita. Even if they never said Kirby, they could they could go back to an artist before, like say Ditko, they mentioned Ditko, and be like. And, but that artist that they mentioned would probably go back to Jack Kirby. So it's always like a six degrees of separation yeah, type that's right, thing. That's right. And I'm sure you could even actually say that about Stan Lee. Oh, 100%. You know. Yeah, 100%. Even though I, I keep saying, you know, well, he, I don't think he was a good writer, but. Yeah, well, dude, you got to remember it was the it fucking was, 40s, but 50s, it was the, and 60s. It was, you know, the ways of the time. So uh, the, one, the next thing that I wanted to get into was uh, Jack Kirby was the first one to draw. This is a big deal. Mm -hmm. First one to draw two specific black superheroes mm. that had their own comic book. This was groundbreaking. Mm. Do you know who I'm talking about? I do. Tell me. Uh Luke Cage and Black Panther. Oh yeah. Give me a give me a pound <laughs> Like they, or is Jack Kirby wanted to call him Coal Coal Man? I think the Coal Man, the Coal Man, yeah, which is a uh, kind of a and his original design was pretty bad too. Yeah, but he was the first one to do that. Yeah, and, like DC wasn't doing it, and uh, of course it, they had a white guy drawing. <laughs> you know, but he still put it out there. Yeah, he still put it out there, and I don't know if uh, Stan wrote either one of those. I don't think he. Did. I don't think he did. No, I don't think he did. But Kirby was the first one to like. You know, this was in the sixties. And I actually watched an interview with him today. He basically said, "I we have to do this. Mm -hmm. Like there, there's there's readers out there that are African American kids that want a hero to identify with. Mm -hmm. We have to do this." So well, you know, the, in the set, well, also you had the uh, well, like black exploitation black exploitation films yeah. back then. Yeah, yeah. and that's kind of Luke, Luke Cage kind of kind of came out of that. But look at Luke Cage today. Yeah. Look at Luke Cage Luke today. Luke Cage is a fucking badass, dude. Yeah, look at Luke Cage today. The heroes for hire. Yeah. You know, like, so you, we got to give Kirby some credit for that because there's True. a lot, so many artists were afraid to do that. Even, at, but at the time he was like, they taught, they, they made him talk like the way they had his dialogue was like that <laughs> kind of jive. Jive talk, turkey. Yeah. Turkey. You know, Sweet Christmas is always, of course, Sweet the famous Christmas. line. Sweet Christmas. Which is cool. It's kind of still stuck around to this day. Yeah. Even in the series, in like the Marvel series, he says Sweet yeah. Christmas. It'll be good, but it fits. Yeah. So the the next thing that I want to get to is uh, right around 1970 mm -hmm. is where Kirby started getting upset with Stan. Oh, you know what? I actually got a clip for this. It, like, I want to talk about how uh, Stan Lee, um, he never really knew why Jack Kirby decided to leave Marvel. Mm -hmm. Uh, but in, in this clip, he, uh, he kind of talks about why, like he thinks he left. So I'm going to go to that right now. What, why did Jack Kirby, I guess he had been doing the fantastic four with you and then went off to DC for a while in, I guess, early seventies, mid seventies. What happened? I really don't know. We never had an argument of any sort. I think Jack felt he wasn't getting paid enough and, um, of course, that wasn't up to me. That was the publisher who paid him. And I didn't want Jack to go. And I said at the time, Jack, instead of being a freelance uh, artist, why don't you join the staff? I'll tell our publisher to make you my partner. You'll See, I was the editor and art director and the head writer. I said, I'll make you the art director. I'll be the editor. We'll work together as a team. You'll make the same salary I make, and we'll be a team. I would have loved that. He didn't want to do it. He said he wanted to be a freelancer, and he thought he could make more money, I think, at DC, and he went there. 
I don't think it worked out. He eventually came back to us, but that was the story. As far as I know, you never really know what goes on inside someone's head, but that's what I think happened. Awesome. Well, well Stan, again, thank you for coming. This is real. And the big thing, like Stan said, you don't know what's going on in somebody's head. You don't, you don't know, like, what Kirby was really thinking. No, you don't. You know. So basically, Kirby left during the run of uh, what I wrote down was the run of the original X Men. Ah, yeah. well, and that was actually one of the uh, I want to prefer preference a little bit. Uh, that was one of the f one of the times too that uh, Stanley went to Jack Kirby with actually a full full idea. Yeah, exactly. And said, "I want I want the characters to look like this. I want them to, to be like this." You know, mm -hmm. it was a full fledged idea. Yeah, and uh, you know, you get, he wasn't you just going to the artist and be like. Do this. It wasn't the Marvel method. No. It wasn't the Marvel. Yeah. It, and I don't know any of the DC titles that Kirby did. I, I well, don't. no, no. Actually, um, Kirby is kind of credited actually now for like, you know, the new gods. Oh. Um, the new gods are probably the biggest thing with like uh, Dark Side and all that. He didn't create Dark Side. I'm pretty sure he didn't. Dark Side is pretty cool. Um, but, the, but yeah, the whole the new, the new gods thing and the whole pretty much almost honestly a little bit of like the celestial, mm -hmm. like kind of the cosmic. Yeah. Uh, well, not the celestials. Although he did create the Eternals. He did. Oh, you're right. You're but right, the new yeah. gods thing was actually his big kind of thing he always wanted to do. Well, I'm like, I, I keep going back to this as like I'm an artist myself, but looking at Kirby's drawings, that's where I draw most of my inspiration from. Yeah. So, but uh, what I wanted to get into was, uh, but that's pretty much what he did at DC, and now he's like credited with that. I mean, and yeah. he he didn't he wasn't there for that long. No, I don't think. Yeah, he was not. He Maybe was a not. few years at most. But he are, but he made such a huge impact on DC, and that just tells you and sh and shows you how impactful like he is as an artist. Yeah, exactly. And the big thing that I found was like, Stan did a bunch of interviews that like cited Kirby. So like he deserves, he deserves credit. He deserves credit. And later in his in Stanley's life, he definitely, pretty much has said that you know if it wasn't for Jack Kirby, you know I wouldn't be where I am now. Oh well, yeah, dude. Yeah. He did, he and and like I said, I'm not trying to discount Stanley and be like he was just some asshole who was working off the backs of other artists and making a name yeah. for himself. Because a lot of people could definitely argue that with like you know like Steve Ditko and John Romita. You know, with Spider Man and all that, because everyone just thinks of Stanley. They don't think of the artist. Yeah. yeah. You know, when you think of Spider Man, like, oh, you think of Stanley. You don't think of John Romita. I do, because I have his John Romita tattoo. But most on my people, leg. you know, out there who who seen the movies, they don't they don't ever think of John Romita. They don't know who John Romita is. John Romita Jr. is my favorite. John Romita Jr. I like. I really I dig his a, art. I have a full run of his stuff over there. Oh yeah, I loved his work on uh, Wolverine. Yeah, and, I, and I'm gonna get into that when we actually talk about Spider Man. Mm. I'm, I'm gonna talk about that. I love his stuff, but yeah, like that was one thing with with Stanley was uh, at least later on, you know, he did try to give credit yeah. to his artists, and I did talk about how he tried to get them as well paid as well, as he possibly yeah. could. So I'll totally give Stanley his due on that. Yeah. So and the, I'm not trying to shit talk Stanley because I'll I'll arm but I want I want I'll, I'll, I'll arm but I want to give you the good <laughs> I want to give you the good with the bad. I don't I don't want to paint paint some rosy ass picture of him of him as like a godlike figure or something that did no wrong. I want to show you the flawed man as well. Right, right. So, uh, continuing in the um, the lineage of Marvel, in the early seventies is when the TV stuff started to hit. You get oh, the bad, bad TV stuff. You get, you get, you get the Hulk. You get, mm -hmm. you get Spider Man, and then Kiss. <laughs> Kiss. Do you remember that? Kiss. What you talking about the band? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they had a comic book TV run and mm. a, and a comic book run themselves. Really? Yeah. It, uh, that was uh, actually saw an interview with uh, Gene Simmons because his mom used to, he used to talk about his mom throwing away his comic books all the time. Yeah, and he came, oh he was a big comic collector. Yeah, he he came home he came home one day one of the inter interviews I saw today he came home and was like, "Mom, you know all those comic books you throw threw away? I'm one of them now." Ah, <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah, that's even though Gene Simmons is a, is kind of a douche. Yeah, I don't. Like Kiss but Christmas. like Sebastian Bach from um, what is it? Uh, Black Label Society. No, yeah, Sebastian Bach. No, he was the other band before him. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know. Anyway, but he's a huge comic fan. Yeah. Um, and uh, Nicholas Cage. You know, you can name off a lot of people out there who that are huge comic. And they fans. actually later on in life, when they finally like got an income, they yeah. went back and bought all those comic books. Like Nicholas Cage had pretty much one of the most pristine copies ever of like, uh, Action Comics number one. 
Yeah. Oh, it was it was like the most pristine copy ever. What? I think. And of course, he's a big Ghost Rider fan. There yes. was actually an auction at one point where Nicolas Cage sold off all his comics. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> so keeping forward, I want to talk about mutants. Okay. Yeah. So Stanley created the idea of mutants. And the funny thing I saw in the interview with him mm-hmm. is he created mutants because he got tired of thinking of an origin for every single individual person with superpowers. Oh. He was like, if they're just born this way, that's... He did have a very... Sp- sen- it seems like he had a very sporadic personality where like he couldn't get locked into one thing. Well, Stanley created the idea of the mutant. Yeah. You know, like, so that's where you, that's where you get the X-Men from. That's where you get... That's where you get to, like, Excalibur from. And, mm-hmm. like, and like uh, Stanley actually didn't create Wolverine. No. It was a guy named Lynn Wine. Oh, okay. Yeah, with uh, uh, in The Incredible Hulk. Uh, yeah, he fought the Which one issue is that? 171? Four. 171, and then in Wolverine, up, uh, Wolverine I want to say episode. Wolverine issue four, his own. his own. Uh, what well, wasn't like Giant Says X-Men number one, like one of his first appearances, too? It was, too? it was, yeah. Yeah. But uh, the big story for Wolverine mm-hmm. was when he fought the Wendigo. Oh, yeah. Well, that was in uh, that was in Incredible Hulk, I believe. So, did I have my shit mixed up? Oh yeah. So it was. Uh, oh, you're right. Yeah. He fought the Hulk, and then the Wendigo was there. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I know my shit, man. Good. good. I've worked a couple comic stores in that's, my life. That's good, man. I don't really read them anymore, but I know my shit. <laughs> I try to. So in uh, 1981, uh, Marvel Comics actually moved from Manhattan to Hollywood. Oh, that's Where, right. Yeah. So that's. Um, that's kind of around the era of like where people started like collecting comic books for like future. Um, well, because they started to see how much the golden age comic books were going yeah, for. They, they started collecting comic books to be like a future cash crop, an investment. That's where that's where in the eighties you got people like the them com- printing like a million com- copies of an issue, and people would buy the the hell out of these things to think that one day they could sell it for a ton they, of money. They called. I remember the- having people coming in into the comic stores in like early two thousands or, or like mid two thousands. Having like a Death of Superman issue, and they were like, "Oh, I should be able to get like five dollars for this." I'm like, "No, it's worth like twenty five cents, dude." I have like ten issues of that shit personally. Yeah, with different covers. But people used to go in and and comic companies, they'd just print, they just people would go out and buy these issues because they think at some point it'd be worth a ton of money. And now, and like that was one thing with eighties comics. When anybody, whenever anybody would bring an eighties comics to a store I worked at, the owner would be like, "I buy them by the pound." Exactly. And it's like, well, how much is it per pound? It's like, I give you a quarter pound uh-huh. for 80s comics, no matter what. Yeah. So if you had brought in a whole long box, you might get like five bucks out of it. Yeah. So what I want to hop into. And he actually had a scale. Like he'd put yeah, these comics yeah, on the scale. Funny. And he'd give him money oh for my that. God. Yeah. So because 80s it, comics, honestly, are they're just not worth anything. Well, that's what I, There's a few out there that are, but for the most part, they're not really worth much at all. One of the big things I want to talk about is the comics crash. Yeah. Like the that's uh, the people collecting buying in bulk and like comic books almost died that's what happened in the 80s man the comic books almost and they print a million copies of, a, of an issue like you look at death of superman they, mm-hmm. how many issues of that did they i print? personally myself people, like people will come in and try to sell it like oh it's the like unwrap like black cover and all this it's it's worth like 10 bucks right or 20 bucks or 50 like, bucks no, like it's not. no it's worth like a dollar dude because a hundred people come in with this because that you know because they printed a million copies of this issue well, and like that's one of the big things. Like, I was a comic book nerd from the time I learned how to read, mm-hmm. and I'll get into this in our next subject. But what year did the comics crash happen? It was from '86 to '94. Okay, so that that's basically when like superheroes almost died. Mm. Superheroes almost died. Mm. Kids today, your millennials that only know Spider-Man. Wolverine, Superman from the movies. Mm-hmm. You have no idea how close we came to losing. Well, that was character. one question I always got asked whenever someone would come in to buy a comic. It was like, oh, you must be doing really well because of uh, all the, the comic movies coming out. And I'm just like, no. No. Oh. We're pretty much doing exactly the same as we were before. Yeah. This exactly. doesn't matter because it doesn't, uh, people reading or people watching comic movies doesn't translate into people reading those. Exactly. Exactly. Although I feel like the comic industry probably isn't in the, Maybe like just uh, story wise, I think it's some of the strongest, strongest it's probably ever been. Well, the writers. One day, I'd really love to talk to someone who has a comic store. Uh, I'd love get, to get someone. I know, them. I know Charlie personally. Who? Charlie's comics. Okay. I know him here personally. in Parts Unknown. Yep. I know. I'd him love from, to get him on the show and talk to him about yeah, the state I'm, of the comic I'm industry. Sure, I'm sure, he would do it. He's he is. Charlie is the one that introduced me to John Constantine. Mm. So yeah. <laughs> but anyway, to get back to Stan Lee. So okay, so like we were talking about like the uh, the death of comic books, the death mm. of superheroes. Yeah. So what happened in 1995 
was the first airing of the X Men cartoon. Oh, I love that cartoon so much. Me too. That and uh, the Spider Man cartoon. I have it right here. So my, <laughs> like like X Men cartoon, the Spider Man cartoon, and Batman the animated series were like my top three well, we're ever. Not, we're not for talking. Comic we're not talking about these. I know, but I just got to say that. Uh, yeah, but so X Men, the X Men cartoon, mm -hmm. the X Men and the animated series. Please check that out, guys. Yeah, if you yeah. haven't watched it, watch it. It's it's on it's all of it's on YouTube. You can watch the entire I don't, I don't know if it's on YouTube. Yes it is. I watched it recently. Really? Yes it is. I might have to look you, that can, up then. you can watch every single episode on YouTube. Uh -huh. and then uh the Spider Man Spider Man the animated series where I, I forget the actors That's not on YouTube because I tried to no, look that shit not, up. It's, it's not, not it's not. But uh one probably of the, find it on Amazon or something. Probably. I know it's not on Netflix. But that the animated series of the comic book stuff is mm -hmm. really what gave a huge injection. Yeah, into and they drew from the comic book stories. A hundred percent. Like yeah. you, you remember? Uh, the one of my all-time favorites is the X Men animated series when they did the Phoenix Saga, and it was like nine parts. I was and gonna, they completely drew from the comics. I was gonna say was gonna from state the Cl this. Chris Claremont run on on yes, Phoenix. Yeah, dude, so he good. completely re-energized that franchise so with the Phoenix good. Saga. But I was gonna state the uh, Savage Land. Mm. That was that was the one that I was gonna. Particular. Well, that was part of that whole thing too. It or, was. No, no, that was an, that was another it, series. It, well, Sauron was part of the Phoenix. Yeah, the Phoenix Saga. Okay. But when you get the Mr. Sinister comes when in. When you get into Mr. Sinister, but then like uh, I won't, again, I'm gonna get into Spider Man. Mm -hmm. Like uh, the Spider Man, they man the animated series with that like the that fucking electric guitar riff. <laughs> you know, like dude, come on, man. <laughs> dude, like, no, the three, the really early, early 3D animation. Yeah, yeah. So that's what really. Uh, breathe new life mm -hmm. into the you know like, in the industry it, it really did it did and people don't really understand that you know and then the next part is like uh, when you get into the superhero movies yeah you know, because mm -hmm. you know they, it was like the 90s so you're all preferencing or you're all putting this on like stan lee so you're coming from like what Stanley started to. That's what I'm getting okay, at. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. okay, good. I wanted, I just wanted to make sure, give it some context to, yeah. the, to why you're talking about this. Yeah, so without Stanley, this stuff wouldn't be happening. Mm -hmm. You get into superhero movies every single to date, and I'm going to get into this at the end, but every single super Marvel movie to date, mm -hmm. Stan has been there. Oh yeah, and one every single one. Even I think they they see they film the scenes of it. They like they're like, yeah, we got another like ten twenty in the can with Stanley cameos. Well, yeah, and they're still in the can. Yeah, they even threw him in in uh, into the Spider Verse. They threw a little cameo with him what in there. What would be okay? Here's another question I'll throw at you. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite comic book movie? Ooh, um, you don't have to stay. I really love. I really Marvel. No, well, no. I for comic. I really loved Infinity War. I, I feel too. that I might be too. my number one, but if I had to pick number two, it was probably the first Guardians of the Galaxy. Mine would be this is kind of a kind of a easy to, to predict. Mm -hmm. but the first Spider Man movie, the very first Spider Man movie. Oh, okay. I remember seeing that. You know, did you say you hated Tobey Tobey Maguire? That was at this that's Mr. Mayhem. At, at, <laughs> no, I did. Yeah. At, at this point, mm -hmm. I hate I hate Tobey Maguire. Well, Spider Man Two was actually better. It was. It was better. But the thing is, is this was the first time. You got to see the uh, the fucking webhead, mm -hmm. your friendly neighborhood Spider Man, mm -hmm. on the main screen. True. And, you know, like I remember going, I saw that movie in the theater six times. Wow. Well, and Stanley had a cameo in that. Of course he did. So what I want to kind of like in closing, like Stan is always going to be a legend. Mm -hmm. Jack Kirby is always going to be a legend. Mm -hmm. And uh, November twelfth. It's where I guess in the comics community, like either side on the Stanley side or the Jack Kirby side. I'm Stanley all day. I because I'm I'm more Jack Kirby like. I feel I feel even to this day he hasn't really gotten his due. Well, I I get that he kind of has, but he, not anywhere close to like, because most people you you know can say like, oh, I know who Stan Lee is, but if you say like, oh, have you heard of Jack Kirby? Like, who the fuck is Jack Kirby? Well, it's because you're not a fan. Yeah, like if you don't know the material, if you don't know the name of Jack Kirby, you don't deserve to <laughs> read these books. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna be on record to say that. Mm -hmm. Like, if you don't know the name of Jack Kirby. You don't That's why he's known as the King. That's Jack right. the King Kirby. That's right. So what I want to say in closing is uh, November twelfth, nineteen or November twelfth, two thousand eighteen, we lost Stanley at mm -hmm. the age of ninety five. When did uh, Jack Kirby die? Oh, I didn't write that down. Ah. I didn't write that down. Actually, I might have, but I have to go back into my notes. Yeah. But uh, I'm gonna look it up while you're talking. Yeah. 
So to me and anybody that knows me knows that uh, the day that Stanley passed, I cried like a baby. You did, man. I, I like. You, did you come over and I was crying? Maybe. Like, yeah, that was. It uh, might have happened. Like I, I remember like losing my shit. But like he, Stan brought to me some of my favorite stuff in my life. Yeah, you know, like that's the best way I can put it. Like he, he wrote it out. Now Jack Kirby died in, on February six, uh, February sixth, nineteen ninety four, nineteen ninety four, Thousand Oaks, California. He probably worked up to the de- day he died too. You know he probably did, dude. I honestly don't doubt it. I mean, I'm gonna, gangster. I'll look it up right now. I mean, he was a fucking gangster. Without, like I said, without him, dude, we wouldn't have. Yeah, notable works: fan- Captain America, Fantastic Four, Fourth World titles, Hulk, Commandy, Manhunter. Um, oh, so Martian Manhunter. Well, no, because Martian Manhunter was completely different from Manhunter. Well, uh, Martian Newsboy, Manhunter Newsboy R-I-B-C. Legion, and X Men. Or the what's that? I'm, I'm just looking at Wikipedia right now and seeing uh, the stuff. Um, yeah, he died at uh, uh, age of 76 from heart failure. Really? He had, they uh Carew was married. I'm gonna uh, give you a little bit of preference. Yeah. Carew was married to Rosalind uh, Goldstein in 1942. They had four children and remained married until his death from heart failure in 1994 at the age of 76. Oh, wow, he fucking killed it, dude. He and they have the, the Jack Kirby Awards and the Jack Kirby Hall of Fame were named his honor, and he is known as the King among comic fans for his Fuck many yeah. influential contributions to the media. <clears throat> um, yeah. Or to the medium. On behalf of us here at Nerdy Bones, R.I.P. Jack Kirby. Yeah. R.I.P. Stanley. Oh, and it was Joe Simon who helped create uh, Captain America. Okay, Joe Simon? Yeah, I th- believe it was Joe Simon. <coughs> or, I th- yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Joe, S- Joe Simon. What? Uh, I, I thought we did a pretty good uh, tribute. To yeah, it was Joe Simon. I thought we did a pretty good tribute to Jack Kirby Stanley there. I thought we uh, yeah. kind of really. I'm more of a Jack Kirby fan, personally. Fuck you. I just <laughs> no, just no, because, I mean, that's a joke, dude. Just, I love his ar- <laughs> just because I love his artwork. No, dude, well. I'm an artist, and and, and, and actually, there was one thing actually Jack Kirby fought for towards the end of his life or later in his life was to get the pages back from Marvel that he drew. Absolutely, because he drew like you know hundreds of I comics. Per- I personally own, and he wanted the artwork, and that's actually something now that you look at, and that he might have been a little bit of a contributing factor was getting like the artists be able to like, get their art, exactly. own artwork back. Well, and that that's a that's a subject near and dear to my heart. Because he, I don't, I don't know if he ever really Dude, got much I, of his back. I own, I for the stuff I did on Evil Ernie, mm-hmm. I only got two hundred bucks, mm-hmm. and, you know, and that book is still selling. Yeah, and, you know, and I only got two hundred bucks. But the thing is, is like with him. I looked but at that it. was the way it was back then. Was like you, well, you I, submitted your artwork to the to the comic, and actually they said like uh, Stan Lee he would actually draw on the original pages, yeah. or he would write on the original pages the dialogue. Well, when I did Evil Ernie, that was two thousand seven. Yeah. So, but the uh, the thing is, is like I gotta say, like without him, my style would be different mm-hmm. as far as what I draw would be different. Mm-hmm. You know, without uh, Steve, Dick, without Ditko, my style would yeah. be different. Without John Romita. I'm sure any comic artist going into the field nowadays, like one of the very first people they study for comic art is Jack Kirby. It would have to without be. Without a doubt. It would have to be. You know? And then like uh, one of my other favorites that we didn't mention uh, as far as like not writing, mm-hmm. but he's a writer and artist, is Todd McFarlane. Oh, yeah. He's an amazing artist. Tom, it, and it, I'm sure he drew a lot off Jack Kirby as well. Well, he did. Uh, he did. Uh, he created the symbiote suit in Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. So, but uh, moving forward... Um, we're gonna go into uh, what you playing, what you wa- or yeah. what you watching. After after almost an hour on this, this has been a long topic, but thank you for bearing with I, me. Yeah, man. hopefully thank you bared with us, and hopefully you enjoyed it. But now, now we're gonna go into uh, what you playing, what you watching. So what I've been watching, one of my favorite things, I watched the entire two seasons of it in two days because I stayed home sick. Mm. Is it was called Friends from College. I told you about that one last week. Yeah, I watched the entire thing. And what did you think? I loved it. Really? I loved did it. Did you not? Feel that they were kind of pretentious, or it was definitely pretentious. What I kind of got from it has you have you ever seen um, "You're the Worst"? I I maybe once or twice. It's kind of on that same vein, but the the comedy of it I thought mm. was great. I love Key Michael Key. Yeah, well, he's I, just great. I, the, the comedy, Colby of Smothers it. from uh, How I Met Your Mother. Oh, She's I, great. Well, I, those I, two I, are like married on the show. I have like those people are the worst though. I have like the biggest crush on Colby Smothers. Oh dude. Yeah. yeah, me too. Yeah, I, I would. Uh, but I did love Fred Savage, and like he was but so I, great. Oh, I loved his his uh, his boyfriend. 
Oh, who was that? Beyonce. I don't know his name, but he was the best because he's like, these people are so fucking horrible. Did you see when they left? Because it's like I love it because like what I would say about them is what he says about that. Did you see when they left him behind in the wine vineyard? Oh yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, So definitely check that show out, man. Like I, I stayed home sick for three days. Watch the entire. Check it out if you don't got nothing better to watch. Uh, That's that's what I would rate that. It's like if you got nothing better to watch, watch that. It was. It was. Don't put it on the front of your list yeah, to watch. Exactly. <laughs> what then, else you got? Then after that, I just finished the gifted. Oh yeah, Dude, I've heard that. So, you told me it's really good. So motherfucking good. Yeah. It has uh, what's the guy's name from True Blood? The I guy have, that played Vampire Bill. I have no idea. I fucking hate True Blood. Yeah, but he he's in it. But the uh, the premise of it is uh, this guy is a attorney that puts away mutants mm. and his whole thing is it turns out to where his two kids are mutants mm. and then they're going to be put away into the mutant registry mm. and they decide to go on the run nice and it's good dude it's it's all, i've been watching it on hulu i think it's a fox show mm-hmm. but so it good. is so good then then after that i've been watching it's so fucking stupid it's called the cool kids okay have you seen that no it's got um uh, d- uh David David Michael David Michael Greer. It was a guy from uh, In Living Color. Oh, uh, no, I know who you're talking about. And then David Allen Greer. D- David Allen Greer, and then yeah. Vicky Lawrence. Oh, I think I know what show you're talking it, about. It takes place in Tucson. Does it really? It, yeah. Is it a Fox show? Uh, I don't know. I was gonna say for some reason Fox likes to put shows in Tucson. It, it, I've it, never it, understood that. Even though Seth MacFarlane likes to rail against Tucson well, for whatever reason. It, it takes place at a retirement home in Tucson. Oh, okay. And it's just like they. Who else is in that? Um, I don't remember the name of the actors, but you would know them when you saw them. What's the, what's the name of the show again? The Cool Kids. I'll look it up. Yeah, the, it, it's so funny because it, it all takes place of uh, of these guys, these people, fucking having antics at this fucking retirement home. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the last one I watched, uh, the newest episode was um, Greer had a uh, got the chance to do like a closed circuit TV show, like new show mm. for the for the retirement home. And like they turned the camera on him, and he was. Oh, it's Martin Mull. Is it Martin Mull? Martin Mull. Yeah. yeah, real super short. Yeah, <laughs> and real tiny white, guy. Old white dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, super gay. <laughs> well, I don't think he's really he's gay in real life. But yeah, he always but plays the character life. he plays is yeah. super gay. But oh, it was created by Charlie Day. From uh, oh, I didn't from know Always that. Sunny. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, I did not know that. What else you got? That was what I have for what I'm watching. Oh, I got a few. So let me have it. I want to start off by saying I watched the new season, The Punisher. Dude, I started. Uh, up, I actually uh, really love. I love the new season more than I like the last season. John Benthrall is the Punisher. Dude. Yeah, he is the Punisher. Oh, dude, he really is. I and I really hope Netflix I, I watched, doesn't cancel this one. I, the, I, I really hope they don't. They probably will, but I'm like, I actually really like the ending of it, like the very end of of the season. I like that was the Punisher. The last one that I watched was where he uh, was at a truck stop mm. and he slept with this girl. It was like the first episode. I watched the first three. That's just what I remember. I, the one thing I will say, and I will say is like, and I think they actually kind of corrected it when they did Iron Fist was they, they cut down the season order from 13 to 10. Okay. Because I did feel the season moved kind of slow. For and, Iron Fist. And they kind of did focus more on like side characters a little bit at times. And I'm like, I to get away from this shit. And like, I want to watch more of the Punisher. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I still enjoyed the season. I actually think I enjoyed the season more than the first Dude, season. John, John and I would love to see where it goes. John ba- John Benthrall is actually at the point where when I read Punisher comic books, and he br- do he like fucking his broke his, he did he broke his in the first episode like he broke in, in a fight scene like because I guess he does his, his own stunts. He yep. broke his hands, tore, tore some ligaments. That was in. He the, was telling a story on Jimmy Kimmel that was about in the it. Bathroom. It was in the and bathroom. he was like he he like broke his hand and, and he knew he broke his hand. And then they're like, hey, you need to throw this chair this way. And he's like. My fucking hands broken, but he didn't say anything. It's like just do it, man up, and he fucking did it. And by the end, like some guy was like smashing his hand. It was like, what the fuck, man? Like, and he, yeah, it turned out they had to like put his hand to cast for a few months, and he had to get surgery and shit. Yeah. Um, Jim, John Benthrall. Shout but out, I thought it was a good season. I did. I enjoy the season. I mean, I always enjoy the Marvel shows, but uh, but I'm a huge Punisher fan. I'm one of the like maybe the second or third tattoo I ever got was the Punisher skull. Fuck yeah. Um. Next thing I watched was uh. It's about uh, uh, this festival called the Fire Festival. F Y R E. It was the one that like Jay Z did, or not Jay Z. Uh, ja Rule did. Um, and it's fucking about all this crazy shit that happened with this festival. You might have seen something on like there was this Twitter picture of like people being this festival, and there was like like somebody like served them like some food, and it was like it was like bread with like some lettuce and like a 
piece of cheese on it. And it, it was just a major, major clusterfuck. <laughs> but you get to like see the whole story about how the people behind the scenes who weren't like like the one in charge was like, you need to cancel this shit. You need to not do this. It's it's so fucking crazy, dude. <laughs> this like you should watch it. It's a really good documentary. Really, really good documentary. And then the other thing I watched was a uh, trigger warning. Oh, I saw with that. Killer Mike. Yeah. I will say I watched like the first four episodes were really good. And then I gotta say the last two episodes of the show, and this kind of bugged me a lot. It felt like he had actors on for the last like four episodes of the show. Really? It really did. It was like the last two episodes of the show. It felt like he would he had act, and you could tell these people were actors in the on the show. And I'm like, what the fuck's going on? Like you're trying to do like a documentary series, but I can totally tell these people this are shit's scripted. these people are acting and they're it's scripted. And I was like, and it really bugged the fuck out of me because I'm like, look, dude, the first four episodes of the show I enjoyed and I like what you're putting out there and your ideas. Because I think you've got, got some really interesting ideas, but those last two episodes were like, these fucking suck, dude. Were they garbage? They were fucking terrible. I was so pissed off. I was like, I was like, you fucking put actors in the, you made, you made a fucking, you tried to make an episode like that was kind of was put for, out there of as a documentary, but I can totally tell these people are acting. That's garbage. And it pissed me off. And I'm like, dude, you're fucking better than this. Like, what the fuck? Yeah. And they might, and and maybe, I mean, I and I wanted to try to look up an article and see if they that was the case. Mm. But even if they were like, no, those weren't actors. Like, I can tell those were fucking people you can acting. Tell. You can I tell. can tell those were people acting. That, I hate that. And that made no sense to me. I'm like, how is it four episodes of the show are completely real, and then got, but then the other two are like fake. One of the one of the last ones we have to mention we watched together. Mm-hmm. Was this last episode of Hot Ones where Bobby Lee oh. shit himself? Oh god! <laughs> like I've talked about Hot Ones before, right? So we we watched the episode. Probably it, it, it's basically a show where people eat hot food. Yeah, and Bobby Lee. I think, but most people by now have seen the Hot Ones. He crapped himself. On, <laughs> he crapped himself on uh, live YouTube. I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> you had to bring that up. <laughs> I had to, man. Oh, we're so uh, highbrow on this show. So highbrow. <laughs> So, but the last thing I wanted to bring up I watched was, uh, and this actually, I watched this last night, was uh, Springsteen on Broadway. Oh, I haven't seen that. Yeah, Bruce Springsteen. He, he did a Broadway show, and it's like two and a half hours. But it, it's it's amazing. Like I, It's like he pretty much goes over his whole life story from like when he was a kid and do like, and he, when he was like, you know, he goes from like when he was when he was born and when he was like seven and then when he was into like 12 and when he's in a teenager a boss, and when he was into like, you know, middle age and all that. And it was cool because like it was like really like he'd tell these stories, but then he'd put the music, he'd put the That's songs cool. in there. But you actually like listen to the lyrics, Hell and yeah. you're like, like oh my god, this totally like this is telling a story. And throughout the whole show, like he's telling this whole story about his life. That's awesome, and it's really amazing. And it put and, and like this doesn't happen off me where I can watch them and it puts me in a, in a mood mm-hmm. where I'm like I, I like have to like. I want to stay in this mood for a little bit. And like yeah. I watched the whole thing and I like walked out and like went out in my back in my backyard and just sat on my chair. Contemplated. Didn't want to have my phone out. I just wanted to sit in the backyard in the cold, like staring up at the moon, you know, with the full moon out and, and just like relax and think about like what I just saw. Just take it in. And just and stay in that in that in that in that That's mood. Awesome. You know, in awesome. that in that in that feeling. And I, I really, and I've never been a, much of a Bruce Springsteen fan, but I fucking He's loved the boss, it, man. He's the boss. It really immersed me, and I'm like, I'm like, if I would have, if I would have been gotten gotten a chance to go to that Broadway show, it probably would have been the best show I've ever seen in my life. Oh yeah, have you ever been to a Broadway show? No, me I've neither. never been to New York. Me I me really neither. don't ever want to go to New have York. You, have you ever been to a play? I have. I've been to a couple in my life. I, but only, it's been it's probably been like twenty years since I've been to an actual the only play. One, the only well, one, maybe like fifteen. The only one I ever went to was uh, I don't know who put it on, but it was a uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. Mm. It was. I wouldn't it, be opposed to going to play. I just that's not in my like. It's not my wheelhouse. Yeah, that's what. I was, yeah, it's not. It's not something. I, it's not a world I'm 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 immersed yeah. in or exposed well, the, to. The the. the but night- I had a friend who was like, "Hey, I'm putting on a play," or I know I have a friend who's putting on a play, and I was free that night. I'd be like, "Yeah, I want to go and see that." It'd be kind of cool. It'd be cool to go and see something like that because mm. it is kind of it, it. It sucks, but it is in a way like not a very big art form as a, in our generation. In our generation, well, it's probably been that way for since the advent of movies. You, honestly. you remember, in, like in Family Guy, because it used yeah. to be you'd go out, like that. That was where you got your entertainment was you went out to a play, yeah, or you saw like the traveling like comedian, yeah, or exactly. You saw you went and saw a vaudeville act, yep, yep. You know, 
You remember in Family Guy when uh, he's like, I'm very aware that this is not reality. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? Didn't you do an episode where he did a play? Yeah. And it was yeah, like yeah. really fucking just nuts where I think at the end he was like a Transformer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well, Seth MacFarlane is very talented. Oh, dude, yeah. He, he's, I love he's, the Orville. He's awesome. That's probably what we'll watch after we finish yes, this. We we'll will. watch the Orville. Is, the Orville is uh, collectively Nerdy Bones' uh, favorite TV show. It kind of seems to go there, yeah. Kind of seems to be <laughs> collectively, yes. It was our favorite show. So, uh, do well, we? Well, and you have Hulu, and I don't, so that's yeah. the only time I get a chance to actually watch it. So, do we want to move on to our s- second subject? Well, no, no, we're going to the state in history, and then we'll go on to oh. Spider Man. Fuck me, I'm trying to jump forward. <laughs> you always do that, man. Well, thank you for calling me out. On it. Every so. time, every episode, you're always like, "Oh, let's get on to our next." It's like, dude, we didn't finish. We we have more stuff to say. Yeah. <laughs> so this day in history mm-hmm. in 1983 the a-team debuted that's kind of awesome mr t yeah, that's right dude i loved the a-team i never i might have seen it once or twice maybe. fucking love the a-team dude like the big thing of uh, mr t like i forget his um forget his name in the show but he was always like uh he was uh, afraid of flying yeah so they mr t's always been a really great guy too he's always been like very much about like charity and yeah he, he his big thing, yeah he, he'd go and vi- well he went through cancer yes at one did. point and and he actually started visiting a lot of kids in, in hospitals and stuff i pity the fool yeah so that, that, that goes mr t fuck yeah yeah big ups dude big ups but uh the big thing for the a team for me it was like when i was a little kid mm-hmm. that was like my mom I remember one of my biggest memories with my mom. Mm-hmm. It's like, what do you want to watch? Is it Macgy- <coughs> MacGyver or A Team? Mm. I was like, A Team, motherfucker. Say, I want to chose MacGyver. Uh, a Team, son. Like a paperclip, a styrofoam cup, and uh, a don't piece me, of wire. <laughs> don't get me wrong. I I'm going to make a bomb out of this. <laughs> don't, d- don't get me wrong. I love MacGyver. Yeah. But A Team is my jam. Yeah. But uh, the, other, the other one that I have uh, on this day in 1957, mm-hmm. the Frisbee was invented. What? Yeah, he based it off. It's of funny it. you you say that because I gave Leia a fra- uh, Leia yeah. like he stalked Leia a frisbee earlier to chew on. And the the thing is, is he actually created it after watching UFO sightings. Really? Yeah. No way. Yeah. I want to hear more about this. Yeah, that, I, that's what I wrote down for what I looked at. He like it. probably based the shape off of yeah, UFO. Yeah, he, he based the shape of a frisbee off of a UFO because it like floated in 1957. Uh, 1957. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So that was before with like. It was, before, it was before the episode we did of uh, Barney and Bill. Well, when was Roswell? Like 48? 41. 41? Like 41. Oh, yeah. that was like seven years off. Jeez. Yeah. And then uh, the other one that I have on this day in history in 1982, Hulk Hogan beats the Iron Sheik to firm the. To, Hulk Hogan beats the Iron Sheik to win the first WWF title. Ooh. <laughs> Iron Sheik, man. <laughs> Take me <it> back. <laughs> Like, 1981? Know, 1982. 82. Jesus 82. Christ. I can't believe how long Hulk Hogan was being in the business. Yeah. I haven't heard anything from him for a long time, though. Well, he's still in the business, but he's not wrestling anymore. Well, yeah, he, he stopped that while He's got to be almost 70. I watched dude. a documentary a while back about like the news and everything. Um, well, he had that he had a lawsuit s- against Gawker for posting sex a sex, sex tape. tape. Yeah. That's some crazy shit that went on with that. But, you know, he was on the right side of it. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, maybe he was cheating on his wife. Well, no, they got divorced. Okay. Yeah. She got she got a shit ton of money out of it. But, <laughs> like, but the big thing is, is, like, if you are also entitled to your privacy. Yeah. Like, that was, the, like, have you seen anything from Gawker for the last couple of years? Cause no, that website folded because cause they're gone. Because he won, like, $100 million off them, and yeah. they didn't have that kind of money to pay him yeah, off. they're gone. Yeah. They're, they're gone. Yeah. <laughs> so, but. Not to get political. Sorry. But, Sorry we got political for you. But uh, we all got to see the Hulkster fucking lay it down. Yeah. <laughs> I, wonder what, I wonder what Hulk Hogan's up to now, though. I don't know. He's probably, know. he's just living the quiet life yeah. at well, this point, which is good for him. Yeah, you know? yeah. Good for I, you, dude. <laughs> yeah, hell yeah, fucking Hulkamania. Hope, all day. hope you're still wearing your do rag and yep. you know. Fuck I, yeah. I would, I, hey, you know, with everything I know about Hulk, Hulk Hogan, if I saw him in, in a restaurant sometime, I'd be like, oh yeah, brother, it's fucking Hulk, the Hulk, Hulk Hogan. I'm like, holy shit, he's probably still got those 18 inch pythons. Yeah, <laughs> probably. Did you? Were you ever into wrestling as a kid? 
I watch it every once in a while, and if I was like flipping through the channels and it was on, I'd just kind of put it on. For, for me, I was like super into. It was a soap opera, though. Well, it still is to this. It day. was always interesting to put on, but it's it's still a soap opera to to this oh, day. Yeah, it always will be. Yeah, but like when I was a kid, it was like Macho Man, Randy Savage, oh, yeah. uh, Roddy Roddy Piper, R- Roddy Roddy Piper, uh, Ric Flair, my favorite wrestler of all time, Ric Flair. Woo, woo! <laughs> like yeah. my, my favorite wrestler of all oh. time. And you, you remember uh, Brutus the Barber Beefcake? I feel like I might. His whole thing is when he beat you, he'd shave your head. What? Yeah. Wow. yeah like he, he, he'd pen you and he'd. And I he guess he never beat uh, Hulk Hogan. No. Hulk Hogan's been bald for <laughs> how many decades? Well, I remember. So he always wears a do rag. I don't have the year offhand. I want to say it's 89. Yeah. It's, uh, it was WrestleMania 3 where he, uh, well, where Hulk picked up. Uh, Andre the Giant mm. o- over his shoulder. That was a big dude. Uh, yeah, he dude. was like six. What? Dude, I don't even know, man. He yeah. must have been at least like six five, six six, maybe dude, even close to seven foot, six eight. Dude, he he probably he, weighed like four hundred pounds. Easy. Did you ever see a picture of him holding a beer can? Oh yeah, it's fucking ridiculous. Yeah, there's actually an. Account- he was, a, but he was a really sweet guy. He was awesome, dude. Yeah. Like think about uh, when he was in um, uh, Princess Bride. Most people only know him from the Obey stuff now. Yeah, then Princess Bride. Yeah, but like the thing, like, he's a gentle giant. He did, and he was awesome. Like, yeah, he was. I remember being a little kid, maybe like six or seven years old, and mm-hmm. like Andre the Giant being like the celebrity I wanted yeah. to meet. And he died young. He didn't die like he was he very di- old. He died from uh, pituitary complications. Yeah, we will because he was. Such a giant. Well, he continued growing. Yeah, he never like actually. Well, it's just what, what that I think it's what happens with people with that, that yeah, uh, yeah. disorder. He he was, I like I remember reading accounts of him like being able to drink like fifty to sixty beers in a night. Oh yeah, because like he would hold it in your hand, it would be like a V eight can. Mm-hmm. This is like imagine like holding a V eight can. That's Andre. It's fucking crazy. And he was born. In, he was born in Austria. Mm. <laughs> you know, I was just looking at that guy and I'm like, he was he just seemed like the nicest guy. Yeah, dude. Like I would have loved to just like kind of just shot the shit with that guy. Like, like 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 uh, but I would I would have been like talking about a wrestling. I would just talking about uh, talking with him about life. Yeah. Did you ever see the picture of him that's uh Arnold Schwarzenegger, Kareem Abdul Jabbar, mm. and Andre the Giant standing together? I don't know if I have. Like, fucking cool picture, dude. Because like Arnold looks like he's like this tall. Oh, yeah. He's like this, this little guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, let's keep it moving forward, man. Yeah, we kind of went off on a little sta- tangent there that, with wrestling. That was a good tangent. But it, we went, I, I actually like talking about Andre the Giant. Because I, I, I felt like he was such a sweet guy. Fee, fi, fo, fum, son. But I'm like, I would have totally loved to hang out with that dude. guy. Hell yeah, dude. Because he just seemed like he would have been a nice guy to like share a beer with. Yeah, we lost him too soon. Yeah, but, but that's I, what happens when, you know. I don't know. the. You know, he didn't die because of... Bad choices. No, he died because of his it, condition. Yeah, just medical. Well, he he kept getting bigger. Yeah, you know. So, all right. So, so anyway, on to our uh, topic or next topic of final, night. Final topic of the night: the yeah. amazing yeah. Spider Man. All right, so we're going to finally, on Nerdy Bones, talk about Spider-Man. Spider-Man, Spider-Man. By the way, was, that was the Ramones. Yeah, we, we have to give them a shout-out to that. Yeah. I, wa- I wanted to play the OG theme song, and then Nick like convinced and me. And I was like, no, dude, you need to get Spider-Man. <laughs> Amp these people up. Yeah, so if, like anybody that... <laughs> Anybody that knows me knows that Spider Man is like my favorite thing of all time. Oh yeah, I have it tattooed on the entirety of my. Well, we were t- we were talking about doing episodes. I was like, dude, Spider Man. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, like I didn't even need to do research for Spider Man because this is something that's like my. That's, that's cool. Yeah, this <laughs> that's is good. Like, my favorite thing ever. You got a few little notes, and that's about it. Probably. Yeah. Well, it, the the big thing is like uh, Spider Man is like almost tied to my identity. No. Oh, yeah. Like anybody that knows me, that's known me for more than two minutes, mm-hmm. knows that. I fucking love Spider Man. Oh, yeah. So we'll just like start off with the basics. Like he debuted, he debuted, debuted, debuted in uh, Amazing Fantasies number fifteen in August, uh, nineteen sixty-two. So like he, like we talked about in the Stanley stuff, like mm-hmm. uh, he saved, he saved uh, the Amazing Fantasies. Yeah. 
So like what I want to get into, what I really want to get into is like what Spider Man means to me. Yeah. Whoa. Sorry. <laughs> want to get into what Spider Man means to me? Like uh, Spider Man was one of the big things in my life. Is that my mom passed away when I was really young. Yeah. And uh, my dad actually taught me to read on Spider Man. Mm-hmm. So I I absorbed into this character really early. I think a lot of kids actually were that way. They were like they really learned how to read on comic books. And and and. Yeah, off comics. Yeah, because think about Which it. Which is something that's uncredited for comic books. Well, think about it. It's like these big, colorful splash pages, that is what you would call it. Mm-hmm. And it's like, because I remember my dad like showing me comic book, my dad's personal comic book collection of Spider-Man. And he like opened them up to me, and I'd be like, what's going on there? He's like, well, read what they're saying. I've probably read more comic books than I have actual books. My Honestly, I could I could probably say I've read thousands upon thousands of pages of comics. Myself too, man. Myself too. Like so, Spidey to me was uh, Spidey to me is what got me through personal tragedy as a kid. Mm. Taught me how to read. Mm. Taught me that anybody anybody with willpower could overcome things. Yeah. Like so, Spider Man to me. Dude, oh my god, we're talking Spider Man right now. I'm like, oh <laughs> yeah. my god. How, how many episodes does this take? Like a hundred I think it's hundred and eight. This yeah. episode hundred and eight on Nerdy Bones. Yeah. We haven't had a hundred episode uh, eight episodes of Nerdy Bones, but we've we got, haven't we haven't talked Spidey yet. But on the channel alone, it's it's like number hundred and eight. Yeah, you know, and anybody that's listened to the show more than once, I talk about Constantine all the time. But Spider Man. One day we do have to do Constantine. Yes, we do. I guess now we do have to do it. Yeah, but uh, so Spider Man is the one to me that epitomizes the hero because mm. he is the one that had he's the first one that is the every man's hero and like i actually wrote down like stan wrote when he created spider-man as he was in a full costume he was one of the first heroes in full costume mm. and he did that specifically so anybody could identify with him because he wasn't white he wasn't black he wasn't Female. He and the origin is pretty much to stay exactly the same well, I over to, I you know, get, well, I'm decades. Glad, I'm glad you. I'm his glad. Lo- he got a little younger. I will say over the years. Well, in, in the original story, he got his powers at the age of 15. Oh, okay. But yeah. he looked like he was like 25. Well, it's because. But that was just kind of the way it was. That's because of the spider Pe- powers. Well, also people just looked older back then. <laughs> right. Right. But you know, like without without Spidey, like I would have got into comic books. Mm-hmm. But Spidey for me really like how do i phrase it like he had the coolest costume oh yeah you know like and that's maybe to me it was like why i was like fuck this is still this day spider-man's got the coolest costume fuck man yeah, he does dude fuck yeah he's got the coolest fucking powers yeah. too you like, show that to you show that costume to, to most people in the world and know who it, they who know it is. who he is they yeah. know it. like there's like stuff in japan and and stuff like that well that was actually one thing at one point was a uh, marvel sold the rights to like uh japan to do like a japanese mm-hmm. spider-man show and which he, was completely disconnected from spider-man well, in every even, way he even had like a and it was actually one of the first like kind of uh powder power rangers type shows he took the words right out of yeah, my mouth I yeah i saw like a, a an honest trailer where they talk about the like, japanese spider-man took the words right out of my mouth yeah. but the, the next thing i want to get into is by these powers yeah you know he's got he's got uh spider sense which is in my personal opinion one of his most powerful abilities pretty much precognition it's precognition mm-hmm. i actually actually have a comic book it's they finally showed like fucking uh uh spider sense in the newest avengers trailer right or no 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 they they no not the newest Avengers. Trailer. they showed it in in the newest event like the last event yeah. movie infinity war well, and it was the f- I mean, like it was like even in the first like Spider Man movie like Spider Man Homecoming mm-hmm. they didn't show Spider Sense yeah, exactly how did you not show Spider Sense well I have one comic book that really stands out in this uh, specific topic mm-hmm. it was uh, during the Maximum Carnage series where Peter is swinging through be- between these buildings yeah. and Venom does not activate his Spider Sense oh. because he's derived from his own powers mm-hmm. but. Peter is knocked unconscious by Eddie Brock and he's falling unconsciously falling his spider sense makes his body throw his arm out and throw mm-hmm. a web and catch himself so so if his spider sense can do anything about it mm-hmm. he won't die like uh. it, like it, it like if his bo- if his body can do anything about preventing bodily harm mm-hmm. it'll stop oh I, I gotta say like one thing I always loved about Spider-Man the most was probably his quips yeah, his jokes. <laughs> he, it, like even the mo- the biggest face of danger, no he's matter what, talk shit. He's, he's gonna, gonna talk. Ta- shit. He's gonna talk shit. <laughs> it's <laughs> the, the best way to put it. It's yeah, like he's, he's gonna, gonna talk shit. Yeah, and be like, exactly. You know, uh, like 
Yeah. One, one of my like, favorite. oh, my spider sense is tingling, and it just he throws a joke. Yeah, one of my one of my. Or he's fa- fighting a. He's fighting like fighting like Doctor Octopus, and he's just still making jokes. What it's am like, I? It's like, dude, what the like? He's gonna kill you. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't care. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk shit to this guy and joke. One, one of my favorites is you remember the character Tombstone? Yeah. He's uh, fighting Tombstone in a chemical factory, and Spidey's on the ceiling. And uh, like Spidey's beat up, his fucking his his mask is ripped, mm-hmm. and in the art, his like mask is ripped, and he's like got cuts on his body because yeah. you know you know the character Tombstone. Well, you want to explain who Tomb- Tombstone Tomb- is? Tombstone is basically he was a uh, chemical smuggler, mm. and then had he was his, completely gray too, right? Yeah, yeah, his, he, his face and everything, his body was completely he was gray. A chem- he was a chemical smuggler, ended up getting doused in chemicals. He's also a Punisher villain too. Yes, he was. His body ended up getting doused in chemicals, turning mm. his skin basically into stone. Well, I also want to say how how the Punisher actually originated in Spider Man. He was in Spider Man. Uh, was it one twenty nine? One or one twenty seven? Forty nine. No, you're I you're right. You're right. I think it's Spider Man. And I re- I, sh- I remember the cover is is him like oh yeah look and Spidey. I actually have that like statue. And he's actually the first one to actually tag Spidey with bullets. Oh yeah. He, like, well, he, he thought he was a bad guy at the time. Well, he actually was able to tag Spidey's wrists and shoot his web shooters. Like that. Well, there was it was actually like a two part comic too. Yeah. Like, where yeah. the Punisher actually ended up. Uh, and you meet Whistler, not Whistler, uh, um, microchip. Microchip. Mm. Whistler is Blade. Yeah. So, but it, you think about uh, the spider sense. Like, it's um, it's one of, the, in my opinion, one of the most powerful abilities ever. You know, like, if you have precognition into somebody meaning harm to you, mm-hmm. that's, like, one of the most powerful abilities ever. And then you get into his physical strength. Right now, he's actually one of the strongest physical characters in Marvel. One yeah. of one of the one of the um, stories I want to cite was uh, from 1985, to where he's uh, actually underneath a building that fell. Mm. Do you know what I'm talking about? I, he's it was Spider-Man 129, by the way. Okay, so but I'm I'm citing a story that to where he's actually underneath a building that's mm-hmm. he's actually underneath an entire building. Yeah, and there's like water building up, water like filling the air. That's one of my all-time favorite covers, actually. You know, it was exactly like in the twenties, yeah, you know like exactly Spider-Man twenty something. I've always wanted to own that comic just because I love I that, that cover so much. I have it. Oh, I'm a collector for Spidey, but like he actually stands up, he puts his he puts his hands underneath the the entirety of this building, mm-hmm. puts one ankle underneath his fucking knee, yeah. and stands up and lifts an entire building. Through the sheer strength of will, like Spider Man's strength cannot be discounted. Well, then you told me you told me once in a in a versus episode about he he was actually the strongest. I yes, think, he is right of any Marvel character. Right now, he's toted as like even being stronger than the Hulk. Yeah, is because like the big thing is his strength is actually toted on like his uh, emotions, mm. like even more so than the Hulk, because yeah. the the Hulk is like anger. Yeah, but like I, I uh, one of the things I wanted to cite was uh, cause I want to talk about his role in the Civil War. He um, was outed by Tony Stark as being Peter Parker is the Spider Man, and you know, and he yeah. he was like on the side of a building, like stuck on the side of a building as Peter without the suit. Mm. I was like, what do I do? What do I do? Yeah, and fucking Aunt May ends up getting shot mm. because they're like. I forget what henchman it was. Was like, okay, this is Peter Parker's family. Mm. This is fucking Spider Man's family. We're gonna take. We're gonna take her out. We're gonna fuck him up. So like, Aunt May is in the hospital because she got sniped, mm. and like Peter's on the side of a building, and fucking Iron Man shows up. Yeah, and like they get into a scuffle, and Peter fucking punches the fucking faceplate off of Iron Man's costume. Shit. Yeah, and then and and I remember the. Uh, the last, um, the last cell of that book mm-hmm. is Iron Man cocooned in webs Shit. with the arc light showing through the webs. Well, one thing I got to mention with Spider Man is um, <clears throat> he probably had he when it comes to comic villains, he probably has He's the, got the, be- best the Rose best gallery. Rose Gallery like as uh, like up there with like one and two, and I I couldn't say which one is one and two, but one and two would be Batman. Yeah, yeah. When it comes to be- the best villains. You know, because with villains, you, you know, you get Sinister Sticks, mm-hmm. you know, Doc, Doc Ock, you know. Well, you bring up an amazing point because I wanted to bring up my favorite um, 
Spider-Man storyline, which is Ezekiel, mm. the spider totem. Are you familiar with this? No. So there's a villain named Mo- Morin. It's M-O-U-R-I-N, Morin. And his whole thing is he hunts down totems. Okay. And Peter... Is this was uh, from in, in the Spider-Verse, actually. Way before. Oh, it was before. Way, okay. This is the birth of the Because that Spider-Verse. was something that happened in, in the comic. Well, like, it's the, the comic into the Spider-Verse was well, a guy hunting down it's the birth Spider-Man. Of, it's the birth of the Spider-Verse. Okay. This was like maybe 96, 97. Mm-hmm. So way before the Spider-Verse. So Ezekiel... Ezekiel is the first person on Earth that had the spider totem. Yeah. And Ezekiel's fucking awesome. Like, I remember this really cool artwork of Ezekiel on the side of a building with Peter. Mm. And, you know, like, he's, like, like on the side of the building like, explaining, like, you're not the first person with these powers. Yeah. For, so, basically, Peter was, through destiny, he was predetermined to have these powers no matter what. Whether it was a radioactive accident, mm-hmm. whether it was something, whatever, yeah, he was destined to have these powers. Uh. So Mor- Morin goes through reality, mm-hmm. and he finds totems. And that is kind of the uh, actually premise of uh, Into the Spider Verse. Exactly. It so was it, it, honestly like a lot of times comic book uh, storylines get recycled so yeah. much. So basically, he goes through the universe and finds totems, and then Peter realizes. That all of his villains are totems: mm. the scorpion, the vulture, the mm. octopus. Yeah, oh you, shit! You know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you know, you know, like yeah. Basically, all of all of his villains are totems. Mm. So basically, Morn goes through, and every time he kills a totem, mm-hmm. he gets their power. Yeah, so he gets stronger and stronger and yeah. stronger and stronger. So we are talking about into the Spider Verse. This honestly. is way before the Spider Verse was I know. even a concept. Yeah, I know. This is before it was. I keep even going a back to it, but yeah, they they into the Spider Verse totally copied this. Uh, well, obviously, yeah, yeah. So like, he, more or less, like I, I keep thinking, not necessarily the movie, but the comics, the comic. Because well, I haven't I haven't seen the movie yet. I really neither. want to. Me neither. Me neither. But this is where into the Spider Verse comes from, and, mm-hmm. then, and then you get into the Spider Verse, like. Peter is really the first one that really exposed the comic book world to multiverse, other than the Flash. Yeah. Well, yeah. on the Marvel side, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, because you get like you get Mar- Miles Morales, Miguel O'Hara. Mm-hmm. Um, those are the only two park or only two uh, counterparts that I can think of. You know, you know, Miguel, Miguel O'Hara. Mm. That's uh, two thousand ninety nine. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, uh, so basically. Warren goes through all these universes mm-hmm. and like takes out the spider men oh. the spider man of that timeline that mm-hmm. era and gains their ability oh, and, you know, it's uh, it, that's my personal favorite mm-hmm. like story arc of the mm-hmm. spider man but you know for me Peter is always going to be the spider man Oh yeah, uh, you know, oh, like, no, that's always he's the prime yeah yeah, yeah. He's Peter the Parker prime. is the gold standard yeah, yeah exactly. he's always the one. He, he will actually, that's a good way to put it. He's the one. Yeah. You know, when you think the about one. the Matrix, like, he's the one. Yeah, exactly. He's the best of the best. Yeah, exactly. Of the, the best. You know, and, uh, and, and Marvel. There, if there's a thousand Spider Man, like, he's number one. Peter. The prime yeah. universe, like, Spider Man. Well, they call it uh, Earth 616. Yeah, 616. Yeah. yeah and that's, that's the, the Spider Man that we know. Yeah. That's the Spider Man that my dad knew, mm-hmm. is Earth 616. Yeah. But, you know, like Spider-Man continues to be like the um, I remember reading a story. I forget what it was called, but it was Iron Man and after Peter's death and a particular storyline hmm. where they built a statue of Peter and mm-hmm. Iron, and Tony Stark cited Peter Parker, the Spider-Man being Earth's greatest hero. Oh, yeah. And, you know, like so because he like Peter sacrifices the most. Mm-hmm. He he goes. He in, does. He goes into it so hard. Mm-hmm. He goes into it so like think about having to keep your identity secret, dude. With great power comes great responsibility. Oh, yeah. How did I get it this far without saying that? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> How did we get that far without you saying that? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just uh, I just really wanted to. Um, the Spider Man is I think the best comic book character of all time. Yeah, well, uh, you know he's he's uh, just because he's your, he's your favorite. Well, in closing, it's what he means to me. Yeah, what he like within the timeline in my mm-hmm. life, in the timeline in my life where mm-hmm. I was exposed to him, he got me through so much. Yeah. So yeah, dude. So that's why he means the most to you. Yeah, honestly. yeah. He taught me to read. He got me through my mom's death. He's mm-hmm. got the coolest 
He's got the coolest fucking costume ever. Mm. Coolest fucking powers. You know, like, I, like, you know me, dude. Me and my buddies, like, will hang out and, like, debate, like, who could beat who. Yeah. I mean, with Spider Man, with a topic like Spider Man, you can go on for hours yeah. and hours yeah. and hours. Yeah. And we're not, we're not trying to do that. We're trying to give a little bit well, of a bait. I, I mean, I gave him an idea, but, yeah. like, I kind of more ranted why I love Spider Man. So yeah. We, I mean, we don't, we kind of don't do that. We like to focus on a couple topics and kind of give you the what's what mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. of it. You know, we don't. We could get super in depth. But we just don't do that because <laughs> we like to. We like to kind of keep it going. Yeah, I don't know. exactly. Well, but that's had, why we do what we do. You know. Yeah. Well, I had a good time tonight, man. Oh, me too, yeah, man. Really this is a time. this is a fun episode. You know, this it, like it, you know, definitely Spider Man was more kind of an, a little bit of an afterthought. Yeah. You well, know? we did. I really tonight really felt like a tribute to Sam Lee for me. That's, and that's yeah. Actually, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. It was like, and and just talking about Spider Man for a little bit, it was like you know, kind of. Uh, yeah. You know, really, like, and I'm proud his creation kind of blossomed into. And I'm proud of myself that I didn't cry tonight. <laughs> you got close, man. I did. You did get close, especially at the beginning. Yeah. You start tearing up a little bit. Yeah, but that that simply tells you what it means to me. That simply tells you to like somebody of my age and of my exposure to the topic. Mm-hmm. He's like that. He, it's very important. Oh, definitely. Yeah. No, I was like, yeah. These, I mean. I don't know. <laughs> I, was, I, I thought about something. When I was it's, like, it's all good, man. It's all good. But I, I but it's always like certain things mean certain. Yeah. Like uh, it's have an impact it, on your life at certain times in your life. It's the way things speak to you. Exactly. It's the way things like. You know, a movie or a character or, you know, mm. in a book or a comic or a movie. Yeah. yeah. At some point, you know, really speaks to you for whatever reason. Yeah. You know, it just it has an impact on you. And, and, and for and when it comes to Spider-Man. In your early uh, life, Spider Man had that impact on you because it helped you get through a lot of really. It, it kept, it, it kept it, my mind away from being depressed. Exactly. Yeah. So and that's what comics and entertainment should really do. Yeah, exactly. Is 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 help you, and make your life better. Yeah. You know, and and maybe even just take you away from, from just, something just bad's happening in your for, life. Disconnect. disconnect. Yeah, exactly. Help you disconnect from the world around you. Keep reading comic books, and that's people. and that's a that's what a great story or a character should do, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know. And like, if I ever feel depressed, like I put on some comedy. There you go, you know, there personally, because it helps me just kind of disconnect for a little while. I'm like, let me yeah. forget about this bad thing that happened to me this day. Yeah, well, like even to this day, like I'll like pick up one of my favorite like John Romita Jr. comic books mm-hmm. and like read through them and like i'll be having the worst day that i could have ever had yeah and then I'll, a story that i've read a hundred times mm-hmm. and like i'll take this like inspiration of like how much i love what's going oh, on yeah. this is here here's the spider-man overcoming diversity overcoming the hardest thing ever being the fucking badass yeah and i take inspiration for that in my life mm-hmm. because he's a teenager he's he's the underdog he yeah. got powers that he never wanted, mm-hmm. but he, he's, yeah. He's, he makes you believe you can be more. Yeah, yeah. He's the, I want to say. That's one thing I love about superheroes. They I always, w- they always make you, they always try to tell you, you can be more yeah. than what you are now. I always want to say that Spider-Man is the Everman superhero. Yeah, he really is. Yeah, I think more than anybody, he really is. Yeah, yeah. Because he's just a regular guy who got you know, these powers kind of gifted to him mm-hmm. in a way. Well, not necessarily gifted, but, you know, kind of given to him. And he had to kind of figure out what to do with him. Yeah, exactly. And he chose to be a good guy and and do good things. Yeah, could you imagine what you would do with superpowers? I honestly don't know what I would do exactly. with superpowers. Exactly. I would, I would hope I would try to do good things, but at the same time, I'd be like, I need to make a living. You could hope that. You know? You could hope that. But and you're like, oh, well, something bad's happening in the world right now. I'm like, well, I, I'm at my fucking job. Like, the, I got to make a living. I can't just leave. And The everyday person. And then which always goes into like, well, like, I might have to rob a bank, even though I'm a good guy. Yeah, the, trying the, to make the men's meet. The everyday person, in all honesty, would probably resort to crime. Probably. Yeah. You know, it it all depends on the, the situation you're in, like, financially, honestly, at that point. If you're a billionaire like fucking Batman, I'm like, yeah, I can totally, like, pff, fucking just <laughs> hop out of somewhere and just go and fight crime mm. like it's like oh yeah i gotta leave this meeting I'm like okay yeah. you're you fucking own this company big deal yeah. but if you're like spider-man it's like and you're at a job and you're like oh if i leave this job to go like save this person i'm like i'm gonna lose my job exactly that's kind of a little bit of a moral you know a, 
a debate. So like, big. well, sh- I'm like, should I leave to help this person? I'm like, I'm gonna lose my job. My I can't. I won't be able to pay me. my rent if I, you know, because I'm gonna get fired. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> wow, I can't believe I got yeah. this. So what are we doing next week? Um, next week we're doing Angels and Demons. Angels and Demons. I this episode is a long time coming. Yeah, it is. It's We've good, been talking gonna, about it for the last month. It's gonna be a good. We one. actually wrote out our uh, next month that uh, month's episode yep, today. Yeah, it's gonna be good stuff. Because uh, I wouldn't normally do this. I try to stay away from telling people what we're doing. But uh, next month we have a uh, Samurai and uh, Mandalorians, Mandalorians yeah. from uh, Star Wars. We have a uh, Mitch Hedberg and Bill Big. Hicks. Um, we have an open episode for the third. Yeah, we haven't de- ha- quite decided what we're gonna do with that one. And then we're going to do another Angels and Demons episode, yep, but yep. we're going to do it about uh, Angels and Demons from Supernatural. That's right. Which I'm looking forward to looking those up. Those Because well, yeah. they had so, so many. Oh, and another thing to look forward to this month is on Rufus the Villain, we're going to have Chad again, and we're going to talk uh, like basically ag- agriculture and post, post-apocalyptic post yeah. survival. Well, I wanted to do that for Nerdy Bones. Well, we'll it, also wait and see, though. Yeah, like, it, like with Chad, I don't know what's going to come out of his mouth. <laughs> exactly. I don't know what's going to come out of his mouth. Yeah, but uh, but that's what we got going on the next month. Yeah, um, if you're listening to this later on, hopefully those episodes are out by now, and you want to listen to them and check them out. And uh, the big shout out to uh, Josh tomorrow. We're, we're uh, recording the second part of Jeffrey Dahmer. Mm. Won't won't be first out. episode was great. Yeah, it won't be out till Friday, yeah. but that's for a reason. <laughs> you know, like it, it's uh, a lot of research. Yeah. <laughs> so so anyway, um, in the end, um, thank you for listening. If thank you made you. it this far. Um, hopefully you enjoyed uh, Check us out. talking about Spider-Man and Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Check out Philly Bones this Sunday. Check out, uh, yeah, Philosophical Bones, um, released every Sunday. Mm-hmm. And uh, Rufus the Villain True Crime Corner is always a great, yep. great listen. Yeah. And just whatever else we put out in between, because there's always something else there's we put out in between. There's always some random shit we put some out Some random there. shit we put out in between. Um, but yeah, um, subscribe to us. Uh, hit us up if hit you want to be a guest. If you hit us up. Send us an email. Message on Instagram, message on Facebook. We will always respond to you yeah. no matter what. You tell we're us we're pretty much always going to listen to you. Um, but yeah, you got anything else? No, nah, I think uh, we're good, man. I think we, we got everything. Say, I, I'm glad I got through tonight's episode without bursting into tears. You did. You did. <laughs> All right. And uh, hopefully, uh, listen to us next week. All righty. Nerdy Bones. Mm. And, and we're, we're out. out.